I think living boldly first starts with a knowing of the self, an acceptance of the self, a love of the self, and being able to express that without apologizing. I think when you live life on those terms, then you are bold, and then your impact is also bold. So it was super fun for us because when we started our podcast, it was during the pandemic, the very beginning of it. And it was just the two of us in, <laughs> in a room with a very small table. And it was so close that our knees and our, our faces were like this far from each other. And we're looking at each other in our eyes and we're very, we're very vulnerable, intimate couple anyway. But even for us, um, it was quite an experience. So, uh, each week when we record, for me anyway, it's like it's just the two of us. And in fact, still, I mean, you're here, but it's still, in my mind, it's gonna be the two of us. And then we do expect participation. Yes, and so before Monica uh, begins, as she usually does our podcast, please, we're expecting, especially on a podcast that is dedicated to living boldly, that unlike usually when people are shy to ask questions, that every, how will we know if we've been successful because for every podcast, our goal is at least one person is inspired in some way by what we share. So tonight, tonight we'll know if there are, if every single person here has a question that they want to share with the rest of the listeners and everybody else here in the room, we'll know that we've uh, done our job. I don't care so much about that. <laughs> about if people are, I, honestly, for me, it's less that you're inspired, but more when you ask questions, you're actually, it means you've internalized something and you're ready to take the next step, which is action. And that's when change really happens. So so they ask questions for that reason. Um, all right. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Spiritually Hungry Podcast, episode 82. Live from London. Live from London. And I believe this was your recent resolution of sorts, the topic of living boldly. We were out to dinner with a couple recently, and you shared that. And then the husband of our friend said, well, you've married a bold woman, didn't you? Um and I didn't start out like that. So I love this concept and I love where we're going to go with it. Yeah. For me, as Monica said, it's something I've been thinking about a lot lately. I think about this, I think often, but certainly lately. And there's a teaching from Rav Ashlag, the founder of the center, that for me is fundamental in everything in life. And he says that if you stand in front of a piece of wood and you hit it a thousand times lightly, a million times lightly, chances are nothing is going to happen. In order for something to break, you have to hit it once with all of your force. And I think as we think about it, and I'm talking about for ourselves and, and hopefully for all of our listeners, everybody here as well, that difference between putting 100% effort in everything all the time, as opposed to putting in 80% effort most of the time, is what separates an individual who will actually achieve what their soul came into this world to achieve and those who won't. One of my favorite verses from King Solomon, the wise man, he said that most people live an almost life. Almost life. And that word, kimat, again in the original, is something that scares me, and it should scare all of us, because we have so much to do, every single one of us and so much more to experience from our relationships, from our work, certainly from our spiritual work. But unless we are constantly living with the mindset of boldness, then unfortunately we can come to the end and realize we lived a good life, we did good things, but not great things. That we lived a life that was, again, I'm assuming everybody listening, everybody here in the room, we're all good people. We wouldn't be listening to this if we weren't. But it's not about being a good person. And it's not about, even about doing good. The question has to be, more importantly, how can I live boldly? Which means, how can I invest more effort, more energy into all areas of my life? Because then, and only then, can I be sure that I'm actually accomplishing the purpose for which my soul came into this world? And maybe more importantly, experience life in a much richer, fuller way. So I'll challenge you off the start. Go for it. I don't think it's just about effort. I think it's about putting your whole self in because somebody can put a lot of effort into 
making a pie and unless they researched what the best thing is or they know their taste and their flavors or if they're allergic to gluten or whatever the case may be or dairy then they can put their whole effort in but they're going to be disappointed with the outcome right i think living boldly first starts with a knowing of the self an acceptance of the self a love of the self and being able to express that without apologizing i think when you live life on those terms then you are bold and then your impact is also bold no, absolutely, I agree. Okay. I, don't, I don't disagree. <laughs> I will just say, and I do think this is so important, every single one of us can find, if not many areas, certainly a few areas that are important to us, that we are not living boldly. And even if we have the information, even if we have the understandings, too often we're not living every part to its fullest. I would say... As a general rule, mo most of us, most of the time, are not. So let's start with um, what being living bold means to me. So living a life where you go for the things that you want, where you live on your own terms, where you frame your own narrative. You don't let other people define your limits. You define your own limits, and you don't have many. You say what you mean. You set boundaries. All the areas of your life are working and working together in balance, which is really hard to attain, but you can do it. You prioritize your needs and desires. You dare greatly. You love greatly. You don't make decisions based on fear. You seek out the things that you find enjoyable and you enjoy them to the fullest. You have vision and you believe in both your own power and your power to positively impact the people around you in the world. Now, Based on that list, it seems almost impossible to do all of those things. But I can say, if you start and you slowly chip away, I mean, you gave the analogy about the wood, but I can tell you, I didn't rupture my tendon by one swift move. It was wear and tear over time. I do think that if you start to chip away at the things that limit you, especially the negative false belief systems, the illusions that we have, I think that's the beginning of living in a bold way. And I know I shared this in our last podcast, but I think the quote really is good for this one as well. It was um, Theodore Roosevelt said, it's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, who at the best knows in the end of the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least he fails while daring greatly. Now, who doesn't want to be in that arena? Yeah, and I would say that, unfortunately, one of the aspects, and we've, you know, we have the opportunity to meet many people, many people here tonight as well, that one of the axioms is that unless you are actively going through what makes you uncomfortable, what scares you, there's no chance, and doing, doing that consistently, there's no chance of living your best life. Living You're always the life. reading my notes over oh, yeah, my I'm shoulder. Sorry. I was <laughs> going to say it's about discomfort. But right, okay. right. So, so before, <laughs> before uh, taking up too much of what you were going to say, I would just say simply that the path to living boldly, more importantly, the path to living the purpose of our soul, the path to happiness, is must go through relatively consistently what makes us uncomfortable, what, get, what we fear, what we don't want to do. And it's not just about the first leap. It's not just choosing discomfort. Constant. It's about every day doing things that scare you, d taking the road that's more difficult. It's choosing that over and over again, because when you live a life of discomfort, you actually are able to see the world through a new set of eyes. You see things, you experience life in a different way. It's kind of like all of your senses come to life again because you're putting yourself in an area that you don't know, that you don't control, you don't know the outcome, you have to be vulnerable, it's a bit scary, and you could be rejected. And it sounds terrifying and horrible the way I've just described it, but the alternative is that you live a life where you're in the almost, as you said. It's safe, it's okay, it's not amazing, it's not bad, it's better than most. But you're never really going to be happy in that space, and you're really also never going to discover the purpose of your soul and your true potential. What I would add to that is that your soul will not let you be happy. You know, so often people don't even know why they're unhappy, why they feel unfulfilled. And the answer is relatively simple. Because your soul knows what you might not consciously know. 
your soul knows that it came into this world to do very important things. And, maybe, and your job is to discover that in a lifetime. And unless you are discovering that and living that, you can be successful in many other areas and you can have success, whatever that looks like or feels like, but your soul will not be satisfied and then you will never be satisfied. So as I often like to say, even though we put it forth as choices and decisions, the reality is that if you want to live the most fulfilling life that you're meant to live, it's not really a choice because your soul knows and your soul will not be satisfied, will feel uneasy unless and until when you are pushing yourselves in the way that you need to in order to fulfill your soul's purpose, in order to fulfill your, your soul's purpose in this world. What's so interesting, often when I speak with couples and I meet with different people, they have all kinds of notions about, you know, what a happy relationship would look like. You know, don't rock the boat, don't say things too much, just hold your tongue. And it, for me, it's just like, what is the point of any of it? If you're not fully able to show up for yourself and to express yourself and also hear what the other person has to say because you're afraid that things will get uncomfortable, you're never going to be happy. It's just, it's, it's, it makes no sense, really, if you think about it. I wanted to ask you, what does it mean for you personally to live boldly in your life specifically with great detail and <laughs> facts? <laughs> Again, uh, I, I, the true answer is a more general answer. No, that's exactly well, I'll, why I said I'll, very I'll get, specific. I'll, I'll get into details, but first I want to tell the truth and then... And then go, lie? Lie to well, us. No, 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 then go a little bit deeper. So for me, and, I, and again, I hope I'm expressing this clearly enough for, for everybody here and our listeners, that there isn't one area of my life that is important, and there isn't one area in the lives of those listening that cannot benefit from living more boldly in it, living more intensely in it. And so for me personally, what it means, and I try to think about this every single day, sometimes a few times a day. So basically what you just said, there's no downside in trying to live boldly. Not only is there no downside, I, I would go so far as to say that we lose so much every single day by not doing that. And actually, I'll give a small example, and this is from your from your. Uh, That's life. from my life, <laughs> yes. of course. Of course, it's so, from my life. So, a few. It was two. I think it was two or three Saturday nights ago. We went out for on a date, and um, <laughs> and and we were finishing our date. And Monica, great and she, place uh, in New York, by yeah, the way. It's a great place what was that place called? I think it was called uh, the Nines. If I'm not really mistaken. awesome. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then um, Monica noticed the couple next to us. And, um, and she noticed many things about this, that one of Monica's gifts. She knew everything that they were on a date, that she knew their the signs. The first date, I did. <laughs> yes, you know, all of that, right? So Monica's like, you know, I want to go over there. Well, right? I wanted to see if I was right. right. I but, to also see, but also to share a and little bit. And I wanted bit. to connect with them, yes. I did. And again, I think many people, myself included, would be like, you know. No, I said to you, you can wait by the door. <laughs> I'm just going to stop at that <laughs> which table. I did. <laughs> which I did. I said, I don't make you uncomfortable. I'm going to go over there on our way out, and I'll meet you at the door. Because, and, and I think this is the lesson here, <laughs> and this, even though this is a small example, I think often the fear of living boldly is fear of rejection, of, of, of that it might, I might get hurt in some way, right? Because if we, were not, we went up to that table, and they said, excuse me, miss, why you were interrupting us by having a conversation, you know, I would imagine that would not have felt great for you, right? And I think, but I told you, I said, I don't care if they think I'm crazy or not. I, you know, if they do, fine. If not, I think it's a, it's a chance to connect because I got to the place now. I don't really care. Exactly. So, but the point is you went over them and you were right about their date. You were right about their signs. And what did you say, which I thought was really beautiful? I, I said a lot of things. No, at the, at the end you said, <laughs> you said, there's something here. There is some, I said, there's something here. And if you end up together, find me. I don't know if I told them my name, but I was like, <laughs> this, this has all the makings of right. what should work. Right. And my point is, and who knows, right? Because one of the beautiful uh, aspects of the life that we are, have the merit to live is that we often get feedback, positive feedback, people saying, you know, you gave a lecture three years ago in the Philippines and you said this one thing and it influenced me in this way. Every single one of us has that ability. Every single one of us has that ability. And too often we pull back for different reasons. Often I would say egotistical reasons of not wanting to get hurt and so on, or maybe just not being conscious. But the, the bottom line is that this is the choice that we should be making all the time. Back to your question. But by the way, the reason I think that I don't care anymore is because I spent a lot of my time being hurt in life. 
and I was playing it safe all those years and I was getting hurt anyway. And so for me, it was like, okay, that's a fact of life. So I rather discover what happened. Like, let's talk about it. Let's have a conversation. Why did you feel the need to say that to me or about me? And I don't, you know, I'm already feeling rejected. So there, at that, when you really look at life in the big picture, it's going to happen anyway. So why not put yourself out there? So maybe you can learn something from it, or maybe it was a misunderstanding. For me, that is so elevating, so so purposeful. But just to answer your question about what it means to live boldly exactly, for you. For me. So on a daily basis, I will make a choice, make many choices. Somebody reaches out to me, I don't really feel like answering them back. I'll push myself to do it because who knows, maybe in this moment, what I say or a conversation will be significant. Somebody, you know, any, any type of opportunity that I have to interact, even though naturally I might be too busy or maybe to me it might seem unimportant in the moment, that constantly that thought, you want to be happy? You want to live the purpose of your soul? Live boldly, which for me means grab every single opportunity, push yourself and... Again, the good news is, uh, as I would say, is that the more you do that, and I can guarantee this, you will actually be happier. But more importantly, you'll actually be doing what your soul came to this world to do. And also, if I could just add, I think that, you know, you taught me, it's interesting, it's, it sounds almost like a contradiction. You know, sometimes you see things and people ask you and you don't, you hold back. And I'll say, why didn't you tell them? Like, well, they didn't really want to know what I had to say or they weren't ready to hear it. So I think there's a fine line between giving the space and really a person desiring to hear what you have to say. But then other times I think it's the fact that, well, they did ask and whether they fully wanted to hear the answer or not. And you saw something, it's important to put yourself out there and whether they accept it or not is up to them. So I think you're doing that more actually, since you made. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. As as you're saying very clearly that often my, my nature is not, not to say, not to say if I think it might hurt somebody, but clearly, if somebody's coming to me asking different types of questions, I need, because, as I said before, because it is against my nature, I do need to be going outside of myself and, and sharing things that they might or might not want to hear, but for the purpose of trying to, to, to help in some way. Because, and again, it's not because of what influence it might have, and hopefully it will have a positive influence on them, but my soul needs that. And again, I just want to go back to that original point. If you realize that your soul needs it, it's not really a choice anymore to live boldly. It's, it's a mistake to not make the constant choice to live boldly because your soul, again, will not be at peace, will not be satisfied. You will therefore not be satisfied unless you're doing everything that you can to push yourself to live in this way. Well, the funny thing is the things that we try to avoid in life, like being vulnerable, facing our fears, living boldly, saying what you think, you can't really hide from that because they're happening anyway. And if you keep trying to protect yourself from the experience of it, you're just going to be stuck. And that's why so many people that come to us, that come to the Kabbalah Center, the number one thing is I feel stuck or I don't have clarity or I don't know what to do next. So I I would say the number one thing is don't avoid the things that are hard. You know, to really live a fulfilled life means you need to do hard things. Yeah, the only caveat I would say is that, unfortunately, even though you said there's no way to, there's no reason or way to do it, unfortunately, you do often see too many people who live a life, about I would say almost, Mm -hmm. where they didn't say the things, where they didn't have those conversations, where they didn't push themselves. It never ends well. It certainly never ends in the way that our soul desires are to end. So I want to talk about five key areas of discomfort that we must embrace to live boldly. So the first is to know that our egos are in direct opposition of our desire to live boldly, right? Because for all the reasons we just said, it's uncomfortable, we have to be vulnerable, right? The ego does not like any of these things. So the first is bold people ask questions without fear of the answer. So back to what I alluded to earlier, is that there was a time in my life where um, I still get a lot of uh, unsolicited feedback, but it was it was it it was negative, right? And before I would make assumptions, which we do, where we ruminate about it, or you know why, or how can I fix this? What can I do? And we get stuck in this. I mean, how many people have lost sleep over that person said this to me? Why did they say it? And what I started to do, if I felt judged or misunderstood, or I even heard something a rumor about me, something negative. I will go up to the person with, with kindness um, and curiosity and say, hey, you know, I heard this thing 
And I really want to know why, you know, first of all, did you say it? And if you did, you know, why? Um, I'm really curious about it. Because for me, again, it doesn't, I'm not invested in the outcome or the opinion, but I, I'm invested in removing space, right? And I can tell you every single time it's been successful because again, I'm not trying to convince anybody of anything. It's just getting information and choosing to do something with it or not. So I'd say that's number one. Yeah, I, on the ego, I think again, it really deserves focus because when we say on the one hand that we will never be satisfied, our soul will never be satisfied unless we're consistently living boldly. The reason, there's only one reason that encompasses all the other reasons why we don't do that. And the answer is the ego. Whether it's because I feel that I might get hurt, whether it's because I feel I'm too small to do that, all the 101 answers that we give ourselves why I'm not going to do that, why I won't push in that way, why I won't take that chance, is all ego. And it's important to understand that while it's a beautiful concept of living boldly, there is a powerful force, a powerful force stopping us every single day. And that's why, as we often say in our podcast, it's not about hearing this tonight or, or hearing this on the podcast and say, oh, nice, that does nothing. Unless you accept and understand that there is this, in, it's not really you, but I will call it an internal voice and force. That works against you. That is working against you. That is trying to make you small. That is trying to make you doubt yourself. That is trying to make you not live boldly. Unless you're aware of the fact that before you woke up this morning, that voice was there. And throughout your day, it's going to tell you things. And it's going to make you doubt, and it's going to make you fear, and it's going to make you not do that. Not make that phone call, not send that text, not, not do that action. It's not free. We, you, don't, you can't just say, oh, I'll live boldly. Nice. That's a nice concept. I'll live my life that way. There is a force that is constant, that is not more powerful than us, but just as strong in our mind. And that is the ego. And you have to accept that. And once you accept that, then you understand that there's a, it's a daily battle. So today, I had 20 opportunities to live boldly. I took 10, 12, 13. I fought those battles great. Tomorrow, brand new. There is this constant battle. You have to accept that there's this internal voice called the ego that is diminishing us in every opportunity, that is telling us not to walk over to the next door table, that is telling us not to push ourselves in, way, in ways that we know can benefit us. And only knowing that enables you to, to overcome it, to choose and to push. Because again, to put it very simply, when you have this choice, hopefully you have that choice, and the voice is telling you no, when you realize that that is the voice that is trying to keep you small, that is the voice that is trying to keep you almost, I must push against it. That's not me. It's certainly not for my benefit. And it's a constant battle. But it's, a worth, it's, the, it's the most important battle and certainly a worthwhile battle. I think everybody in the room tonight and our listeners should look at your day-to-day and what opportunities did you have to live boldly? And what did you choose to do? Did you act on them or did you try to ignore them? To really pause and think about that. The second one is bold people don't let other people criticize criticisms derail them. And we spoke about criticism in our last week's podcast, but avoiding criticism is easy because basically you say nothing, you do nothing and you essentially are nothing, right? Because there's no movement in that. So don't let people's criticisms affect you. I, I would go so far as to say, and it is uh, similar to what we were saying in last week's podcast, that unless people are criticizing you, then I'd be surprised if we're actually accomplishing something in our life. One of the most important indicators, and again, it has to be mindful because some criticism is helpful and we do need to change. But if there's no criticism at all, not likely that we're doing anything important. Yeah. Now, it doesn't have to be 100 people. It could be one person. It could be five people. It could be 10 people. But, but as you know, I mentioned this again. No, you want to be criticized. Yes. My father would often relate that his teacher told him that when you leave this world, if the first thing, if you say, you know, everybody loved me, my father would say his teacher told him that was the first ticket to hell. Because, <laughs> because if you're doing something, certainly something boldly in this world, there's going to be, op there must be opposition. So one of the questions I think important well, again for I'm, everybody uh, that, Opposition's yeah. number four. Oh, we're, sorry. We're on criticism. Sorry. Yes, yes. So, <laughs> well, so, so let me say, it, it, unless, unless uh, you, there, there are, there's at least one person in the world criticizing you, 
you're probably not living boldly. And don't you find that um, criticism is interesting? Because sometimes, like now, I'm like, oh, okay, well, if that's the worst they can say, or that's what they like. Oh, so what is that? I mean, it's it's informative on some level. Of course, you have to be at a place where you can hear things and discern what's true for you or not. But I think it's interesting. Yes. Okay, number three is bold people take the risk of being vulnerable and vulnerability is considered a weakness. And I remember a lot of the feedback I got when I wrote Fears on an Option was, wow, you're so vulnerable. And I, and I was like, wait, did I say anything? That was really like that. <laughs> because for me, it's like saying I have brown hair or brown eyes. Like it's not, because I really believe that anything that I have lived, um, I'm good with and I'm comfortable with. And therefore I feel comfortable sharing it and to help people. But when you talk about vulnerability, it sounds horrible, right? You're putting yourself out there for being able to be criticized and ridiculed or rejected or whatever, because you're putting it all out there. But here's the thing. Vulnerability is not a choice. You're vulnerable every single day of your life, whether you accept it or not. So why not lean into it and allow yourself to be seen? And those people who can't see you for who you are or what you are probably shouldn't get a lot of space in your mind. Absolutely. But I do think, you know, not to underestimate how scary it is to be vulnerable at first right at I mean, first and then and then it's like again it's just not even it's just you know it's my hair is brown right but again the stuff i think for many people the thought again for example even simply it wasn't a big not that big a deal of going over to that next table right making yourself vulnerable it, it can be scary because because of rejection because of the potential for rejection um for example you know i wasn't scared you weren't scared, I know, but a lot oh, of people scared? might be scared. I, I don't know if I'd be scared, I'd be uncomfortable. Um, but, but, but for instance, I, I'll give an example, even answering your question from a few minutes ago. Uh, one of the things that I do is I tell people I love them. And sometimes, you know, you could think, well, if, what if they don't you know, love me as much as I love them? But again, I think in life, you want to take those chances. You really, want do to- Do you ever feel like somebody's not going to say they love you back? They might not mean it. <laughs> Again, I don't really care. I'm, I don't really care. But I, I, I am mindful of the fact that if I feel love towards somebody, express it. And if they don't feel it, good for them or bad for them, whatever, whatever that, uh, that is. My point is that I think we all, you, le- you less maybe than most, appreciate the fear of vulnerability. There is certainly fear. But again, you get to a point, hopefully, by practicing boldness through vulnerability that you're okay with it because and this is you know and we'll get maybe to it a little bit later but that you know i've shared this before but as many of you know many, many of our listeners know we've shared this my mother left this world um about over a year ago and one of the great she's she gave me throughout her life and certainly when she left this world many gifts one of them is again the simple phrase is, 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 is if it's not important, who cares? And that idea that, that, yes, by being vulnerable to more and more people, making yourself more vulnerable, it's very possible, likely, that you will be rejected at times. But I'd rather live a vulnerable and bold life than not have those experiences with all any, any and all rejection that might come with. You're going to be rejected anyway, exactly. right? Well, and I think that, but, I think that this is the thing. I think vulnerability gets harder and harder when you go through life trying to seem perfect, um, trying to never fail, trying to um, have people love you, looking for approval. Right. So if you're trying to make all these things like and hide the past and cover, so vulnerability is is it's impossible, really. Right. So I think it really starts with that understanding that all of those things are necessary for equality life. Brene Brown um, said this, I liked it. She said, vulnerability is not winning or losing. It's having the courage to show up and be seen when we have no control over the outcome. And by the way, we never have any control out of the outcome. Vulnerability is hard and it's scary and it feels dangerous, but it's not as hard or scary or dangerous as getting to the end of our lives and having to ask ourselves, what if I would have shown up? What if I would have said, I love you? There you go, Michael Berg. <laughs> Number four, okay, bold people love the opposition. If you're doing great things in the world, there will be obstacles, opposition, and competition. Living with boldness, we will find that not everyone is supportive, and that's okay. And 
it's interesting because I, you know, I know this and I've accepted it and I, I've learned to appreciate it, but every now and again, it's like, oh my God, does it have to be so hard? And then I remind myself of this truth. The more you're trying to do in the world, the more you put yourself out there, which we, we do, you will be attacked or, you, you know, you will be rejected or you will be criticized even when it's not fair. And that's okay. Yeah. I, I would say it's interesting related to that point and, and the point before, um, there's a famous Irish poet, um, John O'Donoghue, who I really like, and he writes a lot about beauty. But one of the things that he said, which I thought was very important, and it's always true that when you think about death, it makes life hopefully clearer. And he writes about, the, he, he before he became a poet, he was a priest, and he would be with people as they were leaving this world. And he noticed for so many of them how they changed, even in the last week. Yeah, that's so, the, so he was asked, thing. why did they change? Yeah. He said, because they realized that the way they lived their lives up until then, being strong, what they thought was strong, stoic. and vulnerable, stoic, is not going to help them get through this last week. Mm. Wow, and therefore, they beautiful. completely they completely transform. And I think what we're saying is, all of us should take the opportunity to live boldly today, because it might be that we realize it seven days before before we leave this world. Let's realize it now. There is no other path. And yes, there will be criticism and there will be opposition, but there really is no other way for us to truly live. That's so interesting what you just said. They're, they realized there was no other way to get through that week. And that's the thing. In the illusion of our world, we're like, okay, I'll get through it because I'll bulldoze through it or I'll, I'll drink every night or I'll, you know, ignore, I'll be aggressive, whatever it is. And we can get away with that to a certain extent for most of our lives. But in that last week, a real truth comes, a truth that you cannot deny, you cannot escape, you cannot avoid, you cannot convince, you cannot discuss with, that you have to lean into. And that, that knowing, unfortunately, unless you really do some of the things we're talking about tonight, you know, you just don't know until you know, and then there's not a lot of time. Absolutely. Wow. Better, better to learn that lesson years before than in the last seven days. Well, I want to say that... Um, two stories with opposition. One is when I started studying Kabbalah when I was 17, I got a lot of pushback from some members of my family. And um, I was, again, so young. And they were studying Kabbalah, but for them it was more of a esoteric wisdom. So when I was like all in with like the feels and I'm like, this is everything. And I found my purpose in life. They're like, wait a second, you're a kid. And this is just a heady intellectual wisdom. And, um, and we had Friday night dinners. And every Friday night, this was the conversation. Monica, you don't know what you're doing. You don't know what you want. Um, you're doing the wrong thing. And, you know, an uncle was a psychiatrist. You had, like, people in the room that, like, they could, you know, use different. And I remember it was, it was just, it was hard. It was really, really hard. And I got frustrated, and I couldn't articulate myself properly. So then I tried. At first I fought. That didn't work. Then I, then I was silent. That didn't work. And then I realized... Um, I realized that I needed that opposition because I was 99% sure at that time that Kabbalah was my path. And when I had that epiphany that, oh, there's an opening here and that's why they can keep speaking. And I, then I realized I don't need to say anything. I just need to close it in my mind and not allow that space anymore. I never heard another word. I don't know if they said another word. I don't think they did. I think everything ended, but it just, that was the end of it. Another story is, um, Abigail and I, when she was our youngest daughter, she's eight now. So when she was five, Leap came out. It's a great little film. And there's a song in it called Blood, Sweat, and Tears. And uh, she asked me what it meant. So I, I loved the question. And I said, oh, well, it means when you really try very hard, when things are difficult and you persevere through something. So for instance, when you try so hard, to, and she was learning to ride a bike then, so it was very appropriate to ride a bike and you fall and you scrape your knee, there's blood. And you put so much energy and effort into it that you're sweating and it's so hard that you're crying. It's the blood, sweat and tears. But when you do that, you're gonna get through and get to the other side and it's purposeful, you'll be bold. And she said, but what if happens if it happens all at the same time, if I'm bleeding, crying and sweating, how do I make it stop? <laughs> Which I thought was adorable. But the point is, is that it's really that idea that we need that, right, to be bold. We need to have those experiences that are really difficult so we know what we're made of and we don't give up. Absolutely. And it, 
if I can say that one of the thoughts that certainly drives me, and I hope, again, for everybody listening, the fact that we know, or we don't know, I would say, more importantly, that what my soul came into this world to do, nobody else can do. That not only the world today needs my unique light, if I manifest it boldly, but that the history of humanity needs it. That's a big thought. And I think, you know, most of us see our, not almost all of us see ourselves as much smaller than we have the potential to be. And if you wake up every morning and you remind yourself what my soul needs to bring into the world today, Nobody else can, and there is a need for it. And I am so much greater than I see myself now. And, you know, there's many, many instances of this in, in human history, but really the greatest leaders that really changed our world, they always began from a place of thinking that they were too small. I'll give two examples, two of my more favorite ones. There, most of us know the story of Moses, the biblical Moses. And when he was first chosen, to lead the millions and millions of Israelites out of slavery into redemption, he begins with the thought, I can't, I don't, I can't speak properly, I'm not the right person, choose somebody else. He had a stutter? He had a stutter, exactly. He really, he saw himself as too small, as we all do. One of my other, and of course we know, he became a great leader, he pushed himself, he had a lot of opposition, he had a lot of uh, criticism, but nevertheless he transformed the history of the world. Another great soul that inspires me is Jeremiah. And again, when the Creator, it says in the, in the, in the prophets, speaks of the Jeremiah, Jeremiah says, I'm only a young man. And the verse in the original is, don't say you are young, don't say you are small, because I see you as a great soul. And I think one of the, not one, the biggest mistake, the biggest mistake that every single one of us makes every single day is not appreciating how important our impact is today, how important our impact is for the world. And unless you have that as a constant thought, you might not have the, the, the powerful enough impetus to push yourself to be bold. And therefore, I hope, again, for, us, for myself and for, for our listeners, that this thought, maybe I don't have clarity about how great I can be, but I have certainty that I am Whatever I see of myself, however I see myself, is so much smaller than what I have the potential to be. And therefore, I have to live boldly today because even though I don't necessarily see it completely, I know my soul's light, my purpose is important for the world, in not just right now in this moment, good, it's necessary and impossible to be achieved by anybody else. And certainly that speaks for people... Um day to day when they're having a hard day, it's hard to imagine that you can be great and bold when you feel small. But even on your best day, it's nothing compared to what you could be. So the fifth one is pe bold people don't worry about who likes them, or who doesn't, which we kind of touched upon. But some people are just not gonna like you. And that's okay, right? We're not for everybody, nor should we be. It's not like one size fits all, and really shouldn't be concerned about it. But if we go back to the list at the beginning, if you're living life on your own terms, saying what you mean and prioritizing yourself, some people are gonna have a problem with you, of yeah. course. Now, if everybody has a problem with you, you might wanna pause and consider that. But, you know, not everybody's gonna like you. And there's the, um, a doctor and a psychologist, his name's Ben Michaelis, who gives us this goal. If about 85% of people you meet like you, you're probably doing something right. In contrast, if much more than 85% of the people you meet like you, you're probably doing too much to get along. Now, 85% sounded really high to me, actually. Um, I always think like 20% kind of like me, and I'm okay with the rest. <laughs> I like you. I like you. I'm sure no, everybody here likes you. But by you. the way, that's, that's the thing. Like, when we hear something negative, that's all, and we think that, oh my God, everybody thinks that. Like, the, one, the worst thing we've ever heard, we assume... 60% of the population, well, at least I do, thinks that, right? But it's, it's all, all of this is an illusion. None yes. of it really matters. And like you said, it doesn't even matter, right? It doesn't matter. But, but I think it is a good rule of thumb, right? I mean, obviously... But 85% is high, yeah, don't okay. you think? Well, yeah, yeah. 85, I don't know. Okay, so, it's kind of high. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> 15 people out of 100 people you meet, maybe. But it should be more than 50%, let's say, right? More than 50%. But, at the, but more important than that is the other side of that, which is that there aren't people who are not happy with what you're doing, then you're probably not doing enough. 
you're not probably not pushing yourself enough. So we have so I have so much more yes, content, yeah, but, but it's been really. But I, there's a few more things I want to get to, and then we have some questions. So I'm going to skip some content, and then um, maybe we'll have a part two on boldness. But I do want to ask you a few questions. I know how you really? love those. I, I love wouldn't want to um, strip you of that sure. experience. I hate for you to strip me of that. <laughs> <laughs> So, can you share any very deeply personal, uncomfortable stories of realizing when somebody disliked you? Did it shock you? Did it confuse you? And did you feel like it was your responsibility to make them like you? Well, again, I have to go back quite some time. Um, really? <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Unless anybody else wants to share here or send us an email. Oh, email no, no. Of somebody, um, somebody who did not like me. Should I read the question again? Uh, well, no, I'll try. I'll try. No, no, I would say, I, you know, sort of, I, I think w one of the, um, gr certainly growing up, as some of our listeners might know, my parents founded the Kabbalah Center, and they, the, what they were doing was very unpopular. And that, of course, bled into m the, my friends at school, and, uh, and it would often come up. As a matter of fact, this is probably the best example. When I was in eighth grade, my eighth grade teacher was an old friend ex-friend of my father. They grew up together. And he was, and he was not happy with, the, with, with the, what my father was doing, popularizing Kabbalah, bringing it to the masses. So he, he really didn't like my father, who he never saw. He hadn't seen in 20 years. But of course, I was in his class every single day, so I was the one. So he, I can't even, I mean, I can go on, but literally every single day there was something that he did or something that he said um, that then at recess I had to explain to my friends, you know, the few that remained. But the point is, no. The, the point is, no. I did share it with the rabbi, with my father, but, but I think intrinsically, growing up, and maybe it's different than most people's experience, with parents who are doing something important that is clearly unpopular, at least in some circles, you learn that it's important to do the important things and to care less about everything else. Did you so, try to hide yourself, though, a little bit at that time when you felt like your teacher was picking on you and your friends? I, honestly, no. I, I, really, I, really, I really didn't care. That isn't the same way you were like shy for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think so. I think it was the shy by nature. Uh, but um, no, but I, 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 I think that I took it as a given, and that continued on for a number of years. And I think they really um, implanted within me that clarity. Do what's important. Be bold about it. There are going to be people who will oppose you for it, and that's fine. And I don't care less. Do you want to ask me the question? <laughs> <laughs> no. The truth. The truth is, you are. You know. You. Li you know. You live. I would say uh, a bold life. And it's always the thing. You. You. You enjoy confrontation. I. No. I. En uh, I enjoy conversation. Conversation. Yes. <laughs> that might be at times confrontational. It's often we would we sometimes we go out to dinner with people or we'll have a conversation with people and you know you go on for the first five ten minutes of niceties and then Monica comes boring. in with a, with, with a so deep boring. piercing question that doesn't always make everybody comfortable but often leads to much more um, really? fruitful uh, dinners. What? Yeah, I mean, if not, it's a waste of time. I think. Yeah, the first person I realized really didn't like me was my um, sixth grade math teacher. He hated me. I don't really know why. <laughs> really? Yeah, really. Because didn't you were like being me. bold. I think so, and he was not comfortable in his skin at all. He, he was really, really not. And I think that, like, I, I don't know, maybe I looked at him like, I know that you're just, you're not living it. And he, and it was just the way he taught, and he came out as, like, confident. I, I think I probably just looked him in the eyes, like, this is not, no. <laughs> but he picked on me. It was the worst year. I hate math. Um, and then, and actually, I wore, this <laughs> at the time, my sister... I used to steal her clothes and I'd wear them under my clothes and then I'd take my clothes off when I got to school and wear her cooler clothes. So she had this t-shirt of Nancy Reagan. I don't smoke marijuana, but she was on the t-shirt and this teacher, the math teacher, dragged me by the shirt to the principal's office, just anything he could do to pick on me. Um, like, it's not my shirt, it's my sister's. Anyway, I got in trouble. The uh, the second time I really realized I was just, in fact, I was bullied for it. I don't really talk about that much, but it, that was also around that time because I moved from New Orleans to Beverly Hills in the third grade and it was such a different experience. And for many years, it was just not happy there. Um, but this one girl, Leia, she, we were friends and then she hated me. I mean, she terrorized me for a good two years and it's interesting that even at that age, I realized what it was, which is funny. I only realized it years later, right? But 
I went to her house once to, for, you know, to hang out. And um, my mom came to pick me up and her father went to the car and was flirting with my mom. And her parents weren't happily married and she blamed me. So she bullied me for years. I didn't connect it till years later. But so I don't know. I think the fact that I'm able to like not take it. I mean, it hurt. It hurt. Both of those stories hurt. I felt rejected. The pain of it. I felt there wasn't much I could do to fix it. But I was able to say, okay, this isn't really about me. Even though they're making it about me and they're saying horrible things. It's not really because I didn't. I mean, I'm just breathing. Like I either have to deny myself that or just say, okay, well, what else could it be? And because I kept asking the question, I was able to see the truth. So I think it's actually really a powerful tool. I, I was going to share, there, there's um, this really interesting book uh, by Clayton Christensen. Um, he's a professor, he was a professor at Harvard University, amongst many other things. And he wrote a book called, How Will You Measure Your Life? Which I find very, very uh, important. And he says, How will you or how do how you? How will you? How mm -hmm. will you? Um, and it's interesting because he wrote, again, he wrote this book in 2010 after, uh, during which he was diagnosed with, with cancer. And he then passed, he actually lives another 10 years. Mm -hmm. But in the book, I do recommend it. It's called, uh, How Will You Measure Your Life? And I think, you know, it's always better to take these questions ahead of time than, than wait till later. And he says, he puts down really three things that every person must do in order to live boldly, I would say, or more importantly, to live a life that their soul is meant to live. And he uses, he says, the three words are likeness, commitment, and metrics. Likeness, commitment, and metrics. What that means, this does deserve a greater uh, discussion, but I do recommend, again, uh, if, you, if, you, if this is important to you to read that book. Likeness means imagining the person you are meant to be whatever that is, and actually writing it down. He actually writes that he would spend, when he, he went to, he, went, he was a Rhodes Scholar, he went to Oxford University, he would spend nights, every night from 11 to 12 o'clock at night, thinking about, meditating upon what his likeness should be, which means what should he become over the next 50 years, 70 years. And it's important for all of us, really, you know, it's so, unfortunately, it's a cliche almost, that we live day after day after day, not often enough taking that, that step backwards and looking and planning. So he says, if you want to know how you get to the end, living a bold life, living a life that you're meant to live, first of all, create that likeness. How many of us actually have that? So it's the ideal self versus the actual exactly, self. Exactly, exactly. What am I going to be in my perfect, what am I going to be if I live the next 50 years boldly? Number one. And the next is commitment. If that's my goal, I'm, what do I need to commit to doing on a consistent basis, like we spoke about, to become that person? And number three, metrics. How do I count that? And, and one of the things which is foundational to Kabbalah, but also foundational to what he writes and how, do you, how will you measure your life, is the fact that at the end of the day, our life must include the influence we have on others. And the question is, is that one person whose life I improve a week, a month, whatever that number is, but there must be numbers attached to the commitment and to the likeness. And he, he says, and this is based on also research, unless you have those three things on a consistent basis, meaning a maybe evolving view of the likeness of the perfect you in the ultimate state, and a commitment to do what you can and must do to achieve that, and you have metrics, some sort of numbers that you attach to that commitment, that you attach to becoming that likeness, then unfortunately a person can live their lives and at the end, unfortunately, say, wow, you know, there's so much more that I wanted to do, there's so much more that I should have done, rather than get to that point. Let's make sure we're investing the time to create, at least in our mind, that likeness now, as we exist now. Yeah, if not, you kind of just float through life. I think many people equate boldness with being forceful, and thereby a little insensitive at times. But there's no inherent conflict between living your life with boldness and integrity and also being kind. You trust the universe, and ultimately, it always has your back. And here are a few examples of extreme levels of boldness. Harriet Tubman, leading enslaved people to freedom on the Underground Railroad. Rosa Parks, refusing to give up her seat on the bus. Joan of Arc, facing harsh criticism and burning at the stake for her beliefs. I mean, that's a little extreme. <laughs> Anne Frank, hiding from the Nazis. 
the police and firefighters who rushed into the burning towers on 9-11, the people around aboard Flight 93 who prevented the terrorists from attacking the U.S. Capitol. These people embody living boldly at its finest, and they all have one thing in common, their desire to be of service to someone, a mission, a cause, a person beyond themselves outweighed any fears they may have had. And I think that's a really important point that we're kind of just brushing through right now. They each faced major, major challenges, even the threat of death, but they acted selflessly anyway. What desire do you have for good or to affect change that is greater than any fear? And I think that's a really great question to ask yourself in starting to live boldness. What is bigger than you? Because you, the you, not the, the magnitude of who you can be, not the potential of who you can be, but the you that goes through life playing it safe. And there are some examples of everyday acts of courage that I'll give you. A young child who decided to befriend the unpopular kid at school, risking losing their own coolness to offer friendship. A young adult who decides to pursue a career path aligned with their soul's desires despite their parents' lifelong conditioning of them to be or do something entirely different. Ending an unhappy marriage despite fears of how it will affect the kids or what it will look like. Moving somewhere completely foreign and embracing all the new things you'll have to do and learn along the way. Choosing to forgive someone even though you feel vulnerable to being hurt again. Asking someone out even if you're afraid of being rejected. Asking for a promotion or a raise even if you question your own value. Standing up for yourself. Living boldly is not reserved for heroes we learn about in history books. We can live boldly every day and in doing so, inspire others as well. Sometimes it's confusing to say living boldly and we think, how many people does that mean to influence? Again, I know you and I, of course, our desire is to reach millions and millions of people and, and we have the ability to do that. But sometimes living boldly means influencing one person. And I always use the example, some of you, most, many of you might know the story, but my father in 1962 met his teacher. And his teacher did live boldly, and he did do many great things. But in truth, his legacy and impact on history is the fact that he influenced one person, my father, his student. And then my father and my mother influenced millions and millions of people. So sometimes... It's a mistake to think about quantity. You know, I, you know, I need to do something that reaches 10,000 people, 100, whatever that number is. No. If you live boldly, consistently, there might be just be that one person whose life you influence in some way, and that is enough for your soul, that's enough for your purpose. So I think it's important not to get stuck on what that means quantitatively. I need to live boldly because that's what my soul needs, that's what my soul desires, that's the only way I'll be happy. How that manifests, if it's one person of influence who then changes the world, or if it's a hundred people or it's a thousand people, that's less important than the constant choice that I make to live boldly. Well, it always starts with one, always. Yes. So <clears throat> on that vein of being bold, um, do you want to sing a song with me? No. <laughs> Michael, if not, I'm just going to read it alone. You should definitely read um, it alone. Because I think you have a better voice than I do, but let's sing it together. I don't know what song you're talking about. Maybe, or maybe our friends here can join. They What's might not know the song. I know. I know. I know. You know the <laughs> What's song. What's the song? It's "Forever Young" by Bob Dylan. I don't know the words. Oh, I'm gonna help you. Okay, here you go. So, anybody, please. Okay, let's all be free. bold. Sing feel... us. Sing with us. Which is, what's the, which May one? God bless and keep you always. Na, May your wishes na, 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 all come na, na, true. I know the words. May na, you na, always. Na, 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 because why are we singing this? I really think these words are the epitome of what it is to live boldly. I'll okay. sing, I don't care, I'll whatever. Hum. And if you want to criticize my voice, go right ahead. <laughs> but can you at least start I'll the hum, I'll Thank hum. you. No, humming hum. is actually distracting. Okay. Just okay. try to sing with me. <laughs> okay? Uh, May God bless and keep, keep you always. Your May your wishes, wishes all come, come true. true. May you always do for, others, for others and let others do, do for, for you. you. May you build a ladder to the stars and climb on every rung. May you stay forever young. May you grow up to be righteous. May you grow, May you grow up to, to be true. May you always know the truth and see the light surrounding you. May you always be courageous, stand upright and be strong. 
May you stay forever young. One more. May your heart always be joyful. May your song always be sung. I'm really proud of myself. I yes. never sing publicly. There you go. <laughs> May you stay forever, forever young. Well, this was fun. Yes. I, I really like the lives. Usually yeah. uh, the kids are running in the yard with our dog and, and I'm distracted and this is just much, much yes, better. Yes. <laughs> so, um, as always, we hope that you enjoyed listening to this podcast as much as we enjoyed listening to it. I have to say, and I don't mean to hurt anybody's feelings, I really enjoyed this conversation with Monica. It's beautiful to have her. Yes. Uh, and, but continue to send your questions, comments, topics to Monica and Michael at Kabbalah.com. Uh, it inspires us for topics and questions on this podcast. And I know it inspires our listeners as well. Stay spiritually hungry. Bye. Thank you.